when markets speak. We're on the precipice of a colossal migration, like four, five, six, ten, eight trillion dollars is gonna go from what we call financial assets, which is growth stocks and bonds, over to hard assets. And so companies like the Rio Tintos of the world, the BHPs, you know, the, the, the uh, obviously the the, the the copper names like Freeport, um, the, the aluminum names like Alcoa, these are really under-owned and that is a really a great migration that's happening ahead of us. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and of course your host for this channel. And I'm really looking forward to welcoming a first time guest here on Soar Financially. It is Larry McDonald, he's a New York Times bestselling author and founder of the Bear Traps Report. And I'm really looking forward to catching up with him because he wrote a book called, you have to, uh, no, I got to read it. I wrote it down, How to Listen When the Markets Speak. And uh, it's a best sell, it's a best selling book and I'm, you really want to hear what he has to say like the comments on on amazon and the reviews are phenomenal so i'm definitely going to order it once i'm, I'm off this interview because i haven't read it yet so i have to i uh, have to admit I'll, I'll rectify that as soon as possible but uh, I've, I've read the reviews uh neil ferguson neil ferguson somebody i've uh, been following a bit as well has has recommended it so it's got to be a good book and uh based on what i've just uh, you know just had a ch conversation here with larry beforehand a bit I think it's going to be a good conversation as well. Now, without much further ado, Larry, it is a great pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for making the time and welcome on Soar Financially. There you go. There it is. How to, how to <laughs> listen when markets speak. Fantastic. No, I appreciate that. I usually own a lot of the books of my guests here on the channel. And uh, I'll go on Amazon and order it right away. I've read the reviews on Amazon, but I haven't ordered it yet. So I'll need to rectify that. Um, Larry. To, to stay on the topic of the book, we, we need to address maybe as a can opener, the main topic, of course, and to set the scene when Mar how to listen when markets speak. Now we got to understand, like, what, what are the markets telling us right now? And we'll take it from there. Well, if you think about the the, the Lehman failure, which is the, the book starts off, it goes back in time. But the failure of Lehman Brothers, the fiscal and monetary response to that was about four trillion dollars. And now, if you look at the fiscal monetary response to the banking crisis last year and COVID, if you combine that, uh, it's about 16 trillion. So think of four versus 16, four versus 16, fiscal and monetary response. So what gold is telling us in some hard assets is that we're really heading for a whole new regime, like a 1968 to 1981 regime, where they've overcooked the goose on the fiscal and monetary and you're going into an economic slowdown with a 7% deficit, right? And so you, you, they've done a lot politically to keep us out of recession. You know, they, you know, both Republicans and Democrats do this, right? We saw this in 2008. I mean, today, Democrats have impeached Trump twice. They have had four court cases against them. And they went all in with trillions and trillions, you know, they're spending $1 trillion every 100 days, right? That's a fact, right? So they're trying to keep us out of recession by doing the fiscal overdose. And hard assets are telling us that we're heading to that new, totally new dynamic in terms of portfolio construction in 1968 to 1981 portfolio. No, fantastic. Really good intro. I like it. I've taken a lot of notes here, Larry. And of course, lots of rabbit holes we're going to jump down or follow down. Um, let's let's start with the markets in general like and, and maybe what is priced in i kind of like that like you you mentioned gold but of course other markets are pricing in fed cuts and uh, the question is of course the symbolism of a fed cut and w w what is going to be the impact well interest as a percentage of tax receipts is up to 20 like if they keep rates here it's 25 percent. so the interest on the debt versus tax receipts so the market's starting to get the joke and remember most triple a rated sovereign countries even double a's are in the one to seven to maybe eight percent bucket in terms of interest as a percentage of tax receipts and so the market's getting the joke that the fed has to cut i mean it's 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 not and not only that you know the bottom 60 percent of consumers are hurting american express is an all-time high today because the top, you know, five or ten or twenty five, ten percent of consumers are doing really, really well. But under the surface, if you look at companies that face Joe Lunchpail, if you look at the performance of, say, MasterCard and Visa, right? The last they have been massively dislocating relative to the S and P in recent months, and that's those. You're talking about fifteen, sixteen trillion dollars of activity there, and so 
your credit card companies. Look at Capital One. It's underperforming American Express by almost 17 percent. Right. And so you've got companies that face the bottom 60 percent are really hurting. The top five or 10 percent of consumers are booming at the same time. And so the Fed politically is and mathematically in terms of that interest as a percentage of tax receipts, the Fed has no choice but to cut 100 bips over the next, I think, 12 months minimum. Are, are they already too late? I know it's a bit of a standard question, but <laughs> if you look at some of the data, but uh, are they already behind it despite Powell saying like, oh, we're trying to take all the data into consideration and we don't want to be late this time? Are they already too late? Well, if you look at the super regional banks like U.S. Bank Corp, um, Zion's, the amount of commercial real estate losses that they have on their portfolios, uh, yeah, they're they're late. Uh, but once again, it's it's this top 10, 15 percent of consumers that are booming that are keeping everything up. So that's what's making the Fed's job really hard because they're really creating more and more and more inequality. Um, they're too late for certain areas like. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to finance an automobile, a home, if you're a younger couple, you can't afford a home, right? You can't afford, you can't afford an automobile with your, your auto payments have tripled over the last, you know, five or six years, over the last two, two, three, three, two, three years. And so, yeah, they're behind the curve in some ways and, and they're not in others. 100%. And we might have to break that down a little bit because what, what does even a, a quarter basis point or like 25 basis point cut even mean? Like, and I, I mentioned symbolism earlier is like, cause 25 basis point doesn't do much. Right. Um, let, let's talk about the symbolism behind it. And uh, does it really depend on what, Fe, uh, what Fed chairman Powell says in the press conference? Yeah, it's, it's well, typically when the, you get the first cut, that's the start of a long track. So the market's going to price in a lot more cuts uh, in the 70s and 80s, there was this crazy dynamic that's a lot like today where they they start cutting one or two and then they stop and then they hike. And, you know, it was a, it was a totally different world. But in the last 20 years, what, once they start a direction, you know, the market expects a lot more. And so that's part of it that, that's going on. But, yeah, 25 bips doesn't do anything uh, really for middle class families, middle class consumers that are getting, you know, hammered by the cost of living. Just look at internals inside of consumer confidence. It's like if, if you look at income expectations or if you, if you just look at consumer confidence as a whole, it's really at Lehman levels, September 2008 levels. And, uh, you know, the media is very, very uh, deceptive in some ways because they're not reporting, you know, the true pain of the consumer. There's a lot of cheerleading. But I mean, think about it. consumer confidence at 2008 levels. You'd think that would be a news headline, right? Hmm. Not in an election year. It's not going to be. No. Now, it's like we had retail sales numbers come out uh, mm -hmm. about 10 days ago, and the markets went absolutely euphoric. Like, I've, I've, I've done an interview that day, and I called it an everything rally because when I looked at my screen, everything was green. The dollar was green. Gold was green. S&P 500 was green. Bonds were up. I was like, what, what, what is happening? But then uh, I re interviewed Michael Pento earlier this week, and uh, he, he mentioned, well, if you look at retail sales, it's actually below inflation. So it's actually, right. neg it's actually negative. Yes. And, no and nobody talks about it. Is that exactly what you're referring to? Like there is actually that undertone that nobody really looks at? Well, remember, when the retail sales... No so we had the semiconductors, for example, were the strongest group in the market. And they were down like 30, 34% on August 5th. And so the capitulation sell-off that we had there was pretty intense. I mean, that was the strongest sector in the market that was off, you know, more than 30% on August 5th. And so we had this relief and also we had the Fed behind the scenes. There was a, there was a crisis around the Bank of Japan and the Bank of Japan has suppressed rates for a long time. And this carry trade unwound, and it caught it, it caught a whole bunch of people off guard. The assets in the 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 what we call uh, assets under management AUM in the short vol ETF, um, the SVIX had gone from say 100 million earlier in the year to 600 million. So there's a ton of people that are basically shorting volatility into, into this. You know, the summer the expectations were volatility is going to be really slow, you know, low, low, low. Everybody was crowded into the old summer doldrums trade where you just sell volatility and collect, you know, collect, collect, collect premiums every month, every week, every day. And it was just a crowded trade that unwound. So by the time the retail sales never come, came out and you had this kind of inje inje injection of liquidity from the Fed and some things behind the scenes, 
the retail sales got an over um, kind of advertised uh, response. Like the average reporter said, oh, the market's up because of retail sales. <laughs> there was a lot more behind it. Oh, a hundred percent. There had to be like, like what? Like maybe let's, let's specify that a little bit because, like, I'm trying to make sense of this market. Like, I just saw a headline: Wall Street runs out of momentum. I was like, where's the momentum supposed to come from? Like, I've been having this discussion. Of course, it, it seems like we're a bit of a doom and gloom channel almost because we always talk about the negatives. We always predict a market crash, and of course, it's always going to be hard landing scenario here on this channel. But um, like, what are some of the under, other other themes that are playing into this? Like you mentioned, the yen carry trade, for example. Well, the, the big one is, um, so we run a Bloomberg chat. Our clients are mainly uh, institutional investors. We have some family offices, high net worth families, but we run a Bloomberg conversation behind us with you know, 600 institutional investors. And uh, these are veteran investors. They run billions and billions of dollars. And the conversation around artificial intelligence is pretty profound. In other words, we're really in the middle of what's called a cap capital expenditure expenditure overdose. If you think of a scene from The Sopranos, right? Picture five big uh, guys in suits and dark suits pointing guns at each other. Um, and and that's what's happening in Silicon Valley. And we, we talked last week with a, uh, a, a good long-term investor of ours, a billionaire. He's in the Valley. He knows the Zuckerbergs. He knows the Elon Musks. And he's like, listen, if you're a CFO in the Valley, Valley you have to invest. And it's like, they're just so afraid. Uh, it's fear of missing out in terms of artificial intelligence. But the dirty secret he told us is that there's, at least said, Larry, there's zero return on invested capital visibility. So there's zero return on invested capital visibility. All that means is that you're going from 20 billion a year of CapEx for, say, for three companies, three big ones, to maybe two, almost 200 billion a year. But when Ruth Porat and at Google, or if you really press Microsoft, you know, where is that return on capital? Um, they, they, the answers are very weak and they're like, be patient, be patient, be patient. So it's the guys with the guns, they're all forced to invest out of fear, but at the end of the day, there's no visibility or path to profitability. So here's the, here's the silly, you know, the sexy line is that you've got companies that have been cash cows, that have been buying back a lot of stock, that just been producing tons of profits, that are becoming very capital intensive. And if you remember what happened during the energy shale boom, these companies were making a lot of money, they overinvested, and then all of a sudden profits hit and then the companies you know, really fell hard. So that, that, that's, that's the fear is that the, you've got companies that are really profitable that now are over, over investing without any visibility on, on return. And that's gonna start showing up in the profits over the next say four quarters. Well, we've seen that when Microsoft reported, like the numbers were fantastic, but their outlook on CapEx, as you mentioned, was was high and the market sent it downward. I think it lost like seven or nine percent uh, that, that day. Right. So, right. And so, yeah, exactly that. Yeah. They're throwing all in. But then when you say, OK, what's the path to profitability? Where where's this AI going to generate profits from? And uh, nobody really knows yet. But, but Larry, what you're mentioning actually sounds sensible. It doesn't sound like bubble behavior or bubble investing at all. Right now, it actually sounds quite sensible what you're saying that the market actually reacts like, hey, we got to invest way, way more. Um, it doesn't sound like a, a tech boom is happening or maybe we're even past it because the market starts to think like, wait, that, that, that doesn't make any sense. Is that a fair assessment? Like, yeah, it doesn't sound yeah. like bubble behavior. No, there's, there's two trades, really. So in early 2023, the Nasdaq 100 was worth about $12 trillion. So early 2023. And over the course of 23, especially the, you know, the, the really smart money, they started to learn, you know, really hear I me, mean, look at, look at Stan Druck and Miller, look at the investments by some of the real professionals in early 23 on, on artificial intelligence. The street, uh, Kai, was downgrading all, like NVIDIA, all these stocks, Facebook in early, late 24, I'm sorry, late 22 into the first quarter of 23. The street was downgrading a lot of these stocks, uh, these magnificent sevens. Um, but Behind the scenes, there were really smart. George Soros, Drucker Miller. These guys were buying artificial intelligence um, chips companies like NVIDIA. And so, so the NASDAQ 100 in October, I'm sorry, uh, first quarter of 23 was worth, you know, on January 1st, was worth about $12 trillion. By late, by August of this year, that had gotten up to $24 trillion. So $24 trillion in the NASDAQ 100 versus 12 in early 23. And so essentially, most of America's wealth in the S&P and the NASDAQ is in financial assets. 
And I think the great awakening is here is that because the Fed's starting to cut from a high deficit level, um, the probability that inflation normalizes at three to four percent or they have a new inflation target. And so we're really starting to see that with this moving gold, it's telling us that we're on the precipice in this part of my book, when markets mm -hmm. speak, we're on the precipice of a colossal migration, like four, five, six, ten, eight trillion dollars is going to go from what we call financial assets, which is growth stocks and bonds over to hard assets. And so companies like the Rio Tintos of the world, the BHPs, you know, the, the, the uh, obviously the the, the the copper names like Freeport, um, the, the aluminum names like Alcoa, these are really under owned. And there's a really a great migration that's happening ahead of us. It's going to be my YouTube title, $10, $10 trillion moving into gold and hard assets. Fantastic. Let's, <laughs> uh, no, but um, I want to stay on the tech thing for a second before we go to commodities. You already opened the can there, but uh, on, on the tech side, I mentioned to you before we hit the record button. For me, tech is interesting in, in a way that uh, we, we need to boost GDP, and you can do that one way is by, by boosting productivity. And of course, we've seen that AI boom. The question is now in your models and your forecasting, how, how does that factor in? Do you see any impact from AI at this point? Well, you know, just look at look at the conference calls. If they can't explain um, return on invested capital, a path to that, then it's really like 10 year out fantasy stuff. So what happens in any new, new boom, right? Um, you go up on euphoria on a new technology and then down on impatience. And I, I lived through this. I was fortunate enough to sell my company or our dot com company to Morgan Stanley in 1999 in October, which we were blessed, right? So we were able to, to monetize that boom. But what happens is you go up on euphoria and then there's no real path. And so it, all the, the themes that, you're, that people are talking around are increased productivity on, you know, job displacement and things like that on, on, on say graphic designers. Now, all this will be taken over by artificial intelligence, but the real path to this is much longer uh, and slower than people think. And, and that, that's why uh, it sounds sexy, but it's, it's really like a 10, 10 year out scenario. You, you mentioned $16 trillion earlier. Of course, a lot of money uh, went into the consumer's pockets during COVID, like SERP programs and other things. The question now I have for you, Larry, is like, has the money and that's the pig really moved through the Python already? Is like, how, how far to the end are we of uh, final digestion, maybe pooping it out again? <laughs> like, how, how far are we uh, through that uh, analogy here? So we, we do calls. Uh, last week, I was in Toronto and Montreal on do, doing ideas dinners. I was in New York a month before doing ideas in it with hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds. And when you have this conversation over you know, a glass of wine and really dig into it, nobody really knows. Uh, like <laughs> that, it's, it's like, it's so, it's one of these things where the professional investor doesn't really ha have a high conviction view on where the fiscal has gone and, or how much is left in the, in the, in the pipeline. So, We've done a fiscal and monetary response um, because of the way the Chip, CHIPS Act was was structured, the money and a lot of the infrastructure bills, a lot of that's still oozing out. And so that's one of the things that, once again, the, the Democrats are really smart political operatives, right? They, they can't stand Trump, right? They want another four years with Kamala. And so they'll do, they've brilliantly, uh, you know, slow walk this fiscal out. And it's very difficult to see how much is played out. All I can tell you is that if you look at the XLY, which is let's, how to listen when markets speak, if you look at consumer discretionary names like your Home Depots, like your XLY, or, the, or even better, the equal weight XLY, which is a broad basket of consumer discretionary companies. Those are companies that are, that are very, uh, you know, not, not well positioned for recessions, whereas these these companies are essentially down in the year to up one percent. So the RSPD, the, the equal weight consumer discretionary, is telling you that all the fiscal juice is kind of you know is kind of out by now, or a lot of it. The other thing is continuing jobless claims are breaking out. Uh, the other thing is uh, credit card delinquencies are, are are breaking out, and so you have a lot of these things that, that point to the fiscal largesse that was thrown at us over the last three years. Uh, it's hard to tell where it is and how far it's, you know, how much has come out. But a lot of indicators are telling us that, that, that it's long in the tooth. 
It's like I'm, I'm running into a mental barrier, I think. So if we were to lower interest rates again, for example, like, I'm, and I'm keep coming back to housing, like already seeing a lot of um, like interest in, in the housing space, a lot of like, um, what are you calling it? Like a lot of mortgage applications being filled out and filed because everybody expects a drop in rates. And apparently this is the lowest rate it's been in a while again. Like how counterintuitive is even the rate cut at this point? Well, here's the one thing that institutional investors are talking about in our in our conversation behind me is that if you were to get a big amount of like 100 basis points of cuts, um, there's a lot of people stuck in their homes. Uh, so if you look at the existing home sales versus new home sales, it's it's just an incredible spread. And so imagine like imagine you're like a 40 year old couple, uh, 40, you know, and 45 and your kids are going out to school. You want to sell the house, but maybe you have still have some mortgage on it. So you can't sell it because if you if say if you sell the house and you still have a mortgage, then your your rate's going to go from say you know two two and a half two percent to five six or maybe seven depending on the credit score. And so there's some there's some people that, that are saying like if you get that cut in rates, if rates come down, that'll actually bring some supply into the market for the first time. So it's so hard to, to gauge that. It, it really is. Now, it's, it's interesting because like, I, I love referring to like personal life experiences and I'm spending probably too much time on Instagram and Instagram reels here. But um, I, I'm interested in real estate. So I get, I get shown uh, real estate reels, just short clips. And a lot of them are around uh, market collapsing and uh, like uh, metrop uh, metropolitan areas where people expect the housing market to co or not collapse but retract. A lot of it has to do with the Airbnb economy as well, where people yeah. are just trying to get out of the markets. So it's like I'm getting conflicting signals here from the market. I'm trying to make sense of it all, right? Where where it's all headed? Like, wh wh what's your indication? Like, sort of just recap we just mentioned, but like, wh where is it going? Like, in, in terms of real estate. Well, in our first book was called Col a Colossal Failure of Common Sense. It was a New York Times bestseller. And we, we looked at like, you know, teaser rates and all these things that, that were triggering that boom where you could put up no money and, and buy lots of, you could buy two to three homes for almost nothing. But now most of the rates, uh, because of COVID and that move down to rates, everybody locked in a lot of these long-term rates relative to say 2007, six, seven, there was a, a, most of the market, 60% was in the kind of the teaser range because rates had come down a lot and you could just keep keep refinancing. So everybody was doing the short term teaser, one year adjustable rate. And so after COVID, so many people were burnt by the financial crisis that I talk about in my book that uh, everybody locked in the, you know, the longer term, you know, 10, 20, 30 year mortgage. And you could see in the last banking crisis of 2023, a lot of those a lot of that risk is now on the bank balance sheets, right? So in other words, everybody locked in the one, 2%. And so that's on, on the bank side now. And, and so that's a big, I think, problem looking forward because, you know, if you just look at U.S. Bank Corp versus, say, the XLF. So U.S. Bank Corp is the fifth largest bank in the United States. And it's underperformance versus the financials as a whole. Now, the XLF has a lot of Berkshire in there, and it's good, but it's the largest we've ever really seen. And so it points toward, you know, a problem in the next because they kept rates here so long, unless they get them down a lot over the next year, you're going to have, you know, at least another five or six or 10 bank failures. Wow, that's a that's a strong forecast there, uh, and it has me worried because I, I keep seeing uh, tweets about houses, like office buildings, commercial real estate in particular, being marked down and sold at a loss. Although yeah, a lot all, of houses all, are already being yeah. sold at a loss as well. Yeah, Personal all those assets estate. are on the bank balance sheets, and like you can only get away so long, Kai, for keeping the ear. Yeah. yeah, I'm watching the same thing. It's like it's city after city, is day after day, it's building after building that are you know down, you know. So somebody bought it for a hundred million. It's worth, you know, 17 to 25 million. It, it's just over and over and over again. Those losses eventually end up on the bank balance sheets. And that's what, that's another reason why the Fed's going to get forced to cut a lot over the next 18 months.
It's interesting. It almost seems like they're trickling it out very slowly. They're trying to bleed it out slowly. It doesn't show up in one quarter on their balance sheet. So that's just uh, what my gut tells me here. Um, Larry, like you, you brought up August fifth, and I think that's an interesting topic because it could be an interesting case study of what it, of what is to happen if if Dudu literally hits the fan here and everybody tries to exit the market at once. Like, let, let, let's look at August fifth and some of the trading behavior. Like you, you brought up gold. I want to throw that in there as well because it behaved like I expected it to behave. Like it dropped. Like eighty ninety dollars the same day um let, let's analyze that day with for for us uh, larry what, what were your main takeaways um well the main takeaway was that a lot of people were short vol like i said um the vault like i said that short vol atf the assets were up three or four hundred percent from the first quarter to the to the third quarter that's an incredible amount so everybody's short vol and that's why you had this big cover in the VIX. People people don't understand. People, nobody really understood the carry trade. It was up been out there for so long. So you could actually, actually just borrow in yen and buy Bitcoin. It got to the point where you can just borrow in yen, um, try to hedge the currency, and then buy mag seven stocks. And so the longer and longer and longer the Bank of Japan suppressed rates, that allowed this trade to go on. So when it started to unwind in the days before August 5th, it really was unwinding the week before. But then on August 5th, it's very clear that one or two big funds got carted out. And the, the main the main thing that, that I want to tell investors right now is that when, when, you, when you talk to professionals behind me, those bodies have not been unburied. In other words, at least one or two to five, you know, fairly large funds blew up on August 5th, 6th. You just, you don't get that kind of move in the yen or in the Nikkei or in the VIX without a lot of losses. And so it was a massive unwind in a very short period of time. The Fed came in once again with the fire hose, you know, expanded the balance sheet. They're supposed to be in QE, by the way. If you look at the data, they're actually expanding the balance sheet in August a little bit in those weeks. And so they, they brought out the fire hose. We got the relief rally. And, and now, you know, now we're back to like, okay, you know, it's almost like the market needs more drugs. <laughs> it's a wounded victim right now, a little bit to some yeah. extent. No, it's interesting. Like, if you haven't heard anything about that. Like, I haven't heard anything about blowups, any fun, like, sort of disappearing, or even, uh, you know, QE instead of QT as well. So I'm curious if Jerome Powell on Friday uh, makes any remarks on that uh, on that topic. Well, well, the one thing is, remember, so this is a great point that we have to next. I'm, I'm going to bring this up in the chat behind. So when you ha when he knows what, what the smart money is. He knows there were three to four big, uh, essentially mortally wounded institutions. And they may be hedge funds. I'm not, I don't know, I'm not saying it's Goldman Sachs right there, not Goldman Sachs, but it's there's some, some wounded players out there. So that's another reason why he's gonna have to be, you know, far more dovish than meets the eye because the economic data actually bounced last week. Now here's, the, here's an, so here's a really important part. So I'm having this conversation with Jens Nordvig in, in the chat, and we talk, you know, we talk all the time. We're having this conversation with all kinds of investors. In the last 10 days, the economic data has been good, right? There's all kinds of good data last week. And lo and behold, the dollar's puking lower, right? And the conversation behind me is like, it's really weird. Like, why is the dollar that much? If, if, the, if the economic data is strengthening, if there's really Goldilocks, the dollar should be strengthening this week. Right, materially, and the thirty-year Treasury. Look at the thirty-year. Um, we're almost back at the lows again. Look at oil. We're almost back at the lows again. So, the the market is telling us that Powell knows something. Um, they they remember they want that three percent target. So, one of my points in the book, when markets speak, is that the only way out of a thirty-five trillion dollar debt hole. There's only one way. It was two ways: debt jubilee, and that's a massive default which we've seen through many civilizations that have had debt jubilees. It's mentioned in the Bible, right? Or uh, inflating your way out through financial repression. And that's where you keep interest rates uh, below the rate of inflation. So they're going to change the inflation target to 3%, just as sure as God made little green apples. The problem for them is they come out, if they come out and say it blatantly, they will scare the bond market and they don't want to do that. So what they're going to try to do is just open the door like a quarter inch, half inch toward exploring 
or future white papers on a 3% inflation, in, on a 3% inflation target versus 2%, right? So they're gonna move the, over the next five years, they're gonna move it from 3%, from, from 2% to 3%, but they're gonna slow bleed it. They're gonna slow walk it out. Now, once hard assets really get the message that they're on this path, that's when you get the explosion. But what's, what's hurt hard assets over the last year is they're just you know saying higher for longer, higher for longer, they're not admitting the fallacy of what they're up against. And now the fallacy of what they're up against is being is much more well known. And once they admit that they're on a path to a higher inflation target, that's where we really have that massive regime shift from financial assets to hard assets. Again, Larry, there's so many things to follow up on, like the arbitrary 2% number that was just pretty much grabbed out of thin air back in the day when it was set and then going to 3%. Pretty much another arbitrary number, quite honestly. Like, what would it be based on? It's probably just easier not to get back to two and stay at three. I'm curious. Like, we we, we don't have to debate this here, but it's you know, it, it's an interesting topic. We probably spend another thirty minutes on like why why three percent and why is that even the right number? Well, why is it not three and a half or even four? So we right? get into that in the book, and the reason they chose two, and it is arbitrary. But if you look, and we went back in, you know, we'd studied civilization after civilization, we went back hundreds and hundreds of years, we had a whole team working on this. But what's amazing is a civilization at three to 4% inflation over a long period of time um, breaks down because um, it, unless there's a lot of growth, right? And so when you have a, a, you have a country like the United States where uh, you've got an aging population, the boomers, uh, the boomers have 78 trillion of wealth and growth is slowed down, you know, relative to the, to the 60s and the 70s when the, the boomers were younger. Um, if, unless you get a lot of growth and, and we had much less debt now, right now our debt to GDP is at a much higher level. If you're over indebted with lower growth, it, it's very hard to grow your way out. And so the, the only way out is, is a higher inflation target. But the central bankers are afraid of that because they know if you keep inflation at a high level for long, 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 longer periods of time, the pitchforks do come out. <laughs> the pitchforks. <laughs> That's when the bond vigilantes get really mean and aggressive, I guess. Or, you know, so. or people or protests around the Fed around like, okay, if you can't support your family because your taxes are here, your inflation's here, your car payment's here. And you see these videos. I mean, I mean, I don't know if they're politically motivated, but there's thousands of them on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter about some young mother that's 30 years old, um, single mother, one or you know, two or three kids, one kid, and she just can't make ends meet because the inflation's eating her alive. And it's it, over time that forces uh, that will create a social instability for sure. That brings me almost to the topic of politics, but. Uh... Now, let, let's touch on that real quick, because I think it's important. Like, and I was going to ask, like, who, and without getting political, I want to talk politics real quick. Like, who, who's better for the economy, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump? Well, typically, historically, um, markets like a, uh, a deregulation cycle. Um, they like markets typically like less government. And so those are the promises that Trump's making. Uh, Kamala, you know, will... She'll want to, you know, now remember, historically, if you look at the Galbraith, well, if you look at Keynes, right, if you really juice fiscal uh, and get some growth out of it through the CHIPS Act and things like that, uh, that's where, you know, the Democrat view uh, is good for the markets. But we just did that. We just were spending, a, you know, one trillion dollars every hundred days for like over a year. <laughs> so like, you know, so or, or, like we're, we're, we've got, like I said, fiscal and monetary just the last two years, we've done close to $3 trillion of fiscal, right? We're, this year's going to be $1.9. Last year was $1.7. So we're, we're doing that. We're, we're doing that with – we're doing everything the Democrats want to do, and growth has slowed down, and we're heading toward recession. So typically, the markets would, wouldn't mind a Democrat or Republican, but now you're coming out of this kind of fiscal overdose, and you get slower growth, uh, jobless claims are going up. Markets are looking for an alternative to what has just happened. So maybe as a nice segue question there, Larry, is like, who, who's better for gold? Um, it could be, you know, that's a tough one. It could, it, it could be, you know, it could be Kamala. I mean, if, if, if you go, if you keep pushing the fiscal and the Fed is forced 
to, 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 to keep interest rates down through what we call <clears throat> quantitative easing. Um, in other words, buying bonds while, while we're running large deficits, that's a dream for hard assets. Like that is a 1968 to 81 portfolio for sure. Uh, because we were coming out of the, you know, think of 68, we're coming out of the, the great society and we're coming out of the, the Vietnam war. So we had a big fiscal overdose and we had, you know, a nasty Vietnam war. And so that period from 68 to 81, the, at the end of that period from 68 to 81, the top three sectors in the S and P, and we talked about this in the book, were, were industrials, materials, and energy, industrials, materials, and energy. And that made up 49% of the S and P, S and P 500 composition, 49%. Now think about that <clears throat> today, within the last year, those three groups were about down to 12% of the S and P 500 composition. So, if you're in a 1968 to 81 portfolio, you were talking about those three groups, industrials, oil and gas and materials, you know, your uraniums, your coppers, your, all those things should be double. Uh, they should be double in terms of the weighting inside the S&P. That means, that means a double or triple for a lot of the stocks. It's interesting. Like we, I published a, a video just about a, two hours ago, and we got a couple comments already on it, and they're really good questions to ask uh, to ask you, actually, Larry. And to one, one of the comments is: Gold is crazy high, or is it just catching up to its real value? Okay, so the point we make in the book, when Marcus speak, and that's the last plug, <laughs> but it's important. I mean, this we, when we use this, we just came out of we've got two wars, right? Uh, we've got we obviously Ukraine and what's happening in Israel. But over the last 10 years, we've used the sanctions weapon, <clears throat> not just on Russia, but, you know, we counted more than 12 countries. And so the sanctions weapon should be used once every decade the right way. We, governments, whether it be Republican and Democrat, have both been abusing the sanctions weapon. So we're incentivizing money, uh, central bankers around the world, governments to own gold. Um, that They don't want to own too many dollars. And that's why you're seeing a lot of the big developed countries owning less and less and less um, of U.S. treasuries. And so gold's a crowded trade right now relative to silver. The gold-silver ratio is at 85. In a normal commodity bull market, that should be, it should be in the 50s, even 40s. I mean, in a, in a really big raging commodity bull market. Um, the platinum to gold ratio, platinum's as cheap to gold as we've ever seen it. And so if you own gold right now, for the love of God, you want to be taking, say, whatever it is, if you have some million dollars in gold, 30% should be sold and gone into uh, silver, silver miners, platinum, palladium, platinum, palladium miners, like uranium miners, just diversify out of gold into different assets outside of the main mothership. And also to add on to this central bank stuff, at the beginning of any, any bull market, everybody moves into the commodity first, right? Everybody goes into gold first, then it's the miner, then it's the large cap. The cycle is gold, large cap miners, you know, and then junior miners. And so we're not even at the point for junior. So everybody's look at this, look at look at Agnico. It's trading at like 20 times, two to 20 times earnings. It's it's more than twice as expensive as the juniors, right? So everybody's hiding out in gold, they're hiding out in Agnico. And we saw the same thing with oil in 2020. Like everybody was hiding out in 2021. Everybody's hiding out in oil first. Then they're hiding out in Exxon and Chevron. And, you know, a year and a half later, all these uh, smaller oil companies in the XLP exploded, right? The juniors, right? And that's it's the same in the uranium space. It's the same in every cycle. The fast money doesn't move into the smaller names right away. It takes a maturing of the bull market to bring the fast money, the speculative money into the smaller caps. I'm not. I'm not sure which question to ask next, Larry. There's a couple. Like our, our viewers, give me some good thoughts here. But um, what, what, what's driving gold right now? Like uh, you mentioned, central banks, of course, but uh, they doesn't seem like they're the main driver anymore. It's getting like momentum has picked up. It, it feels like somebody's woken up to the trade, and it's not just the central banks anymore. Like who who's entered the trade here, Larry? Yeah, it, you're right. The central bank trade was over the last year, um, but now it's it's looking like. Um, when you're coming into a slowdown with with a deficit that's seven percent of GDP, right, which is World War One, World War Two levels, that alone is going to make people want to own gold uh, because if you 
if your interest as a percentage of tax receipts are 25% during an economic good period, right? If interest, if interest as a percentage of tax receipts, if the, if the GDP slows down, interest as a percentage of tax receipts is going gonna, is gonna to explode higher. So that's the type of thing that forces money into, into hard assets. The other thing is the term premium. So look at last week, right? The 30-year treasury with the VIX above 50 or 60, I think no, above 60 at one point last week, the 30-year treasury could not break, Kai, couldn't break 4%. Think about that. If we went back, we went back 20, 30 years. Whenever you had the VIX at a high level, you know, the long end was rallying. And so what we're seeing is there's less trust because of Trump or or Hunt Harris and MMT. Both political parties are just crazy fiscal lunatics, right? Because of the uncertainty of that, there's less trust on the long end. And when there's less trust on the long end, that money has to go somewhere. And at one point, Kai, we were talking about this in the chat. At one point in like the 60s, it takes them from 1960 to uh, from 1968 to 81. It, in the 80s, at one point, people actually were looking at like that they didn't want to own bonds, right? They just wanted to own stocks that pay good dividends. I mean, the, the people were actually so burnt by bonds by the end of it that they wanted to own other things. They wanted to own gold. They wanted to own gold. I mean, think about this. Barry Gold was one and a half percent of the S and P. Cut. No, it's, no, it's not even in the S and P anymore. <laughs> but yeah, but it would have to be to, like right now. It's like a thirty, forty billion dollar. It would have to be like three hundred to four hundred billion dollar valuation if it was one and a half percent of the S and P. Like that's that's the mindset. So that's what I mean. Is like it's it's when people stop trusting the long end and they they get nervous on the, the global investors, ner more nervous on the fiscal and monetary. It's what you call term premium. And all that means is the longer dated bonds are less trustworthy. And in America, the last 20 years, the long bond has been a real trusty I mean, that's been your go-to, the TLT, your ZROZ. These things have been go-to trustworthy vehicles, right? And now because of this fiscal uncertainty, that's what's driving money. It doesn't take much, but the bond market's so big, it doesn't take much to, to really to, to hold up gold at this level. Last question on gold, and uh, I've, I've seen that question a few times below our videos lately, and it's what, what happens to gold when the market eventually crashes? And uh, I was hinting at it earlier, August 5th, um, like sort of trading behavior. So I'm curious, but I didn't ask my question properly earlier. So just sort of asking again, like, how's gold going to react if everybody, everybody tries to leave uh, an overcrowded trade? Okay, so there's, there's two types of crashes. The one I talk about in our, our first book, is correlation goes to one in the Lehman crisis? Um, we had we, we had a great New York Times bestseller about Lehman. It's now been published in twelve languages, and it's one of the best books in the world about the previous crisis. And when you have a big crisis that's driven by a financial big bank that goes down, Lehman was almost a trillion dollar bank. It was like a seven hundred and eighty billion dollar bank failure. That makes correlation goes to one. So even gold in that period, you know, got got hurt. Um, in, in, a, in a slowdown that's economically driven, that's not like driven by a crash in a, in a, in a bank, um, if correlations doesn't necessarily always go to one. And in that kind of world, gold will go down, but won't go down that much, especially if, if we know the response to the crash is rate cuts and in a weaker dollar. And so this time around, I'm not saying gold for sure will go down. Gold will, is, will go down and always has been um, susceptible to market volatility. But what we've seen in the last 10 years since Lehman, the largest drawdown for gold is only 21%. Think about that. In the last 10 years, the largest drawdown for gold is only 21%. There's a reason for that. And in previous decades, the drawdown was bigger, right? So, so this is really strange. The last like 10 to 12 years, the, in this period, Bitcoin's had four drawdowns of 50 to 80%. In the, since 2017, think about that. Since 2017, Bitcoin has had four draw, draw, drawdowns of 50 to 80 percent. Gold has had only one the last 10, 12 years of 21 percent. So, as a store of value, it's building up. Gold's building up more and more and more confidence, especially like last last month, right? Like we just had this huge crisis. You know, VIX going through the roof, and once again. When you're long Bitcoin, you're actually short the VIX. Like there's never been a VIX that I moved that I can find that where the VIX went from 
20 to 50, where Bitcoin wasn't in a large drawdown, right? And here we had this huge VIX move and gold was barely in a drawdown. Maybe it's a summary question, maybe to put a bow about uh, around everything we've just discussed here, Larry. It's like, if you were to invest $100,000 right now, or if you were to build a, a, a model portfolio, like just for the average Joe of $100,000 for the next six months, like what would that look like? And again, it's not financial advice or anything. It's just a hypothetical discussion sure. here, but uh, curious what uh, what that would look like. Well, you know, there's no I in team. I'm gathering intelligence <laughs> from an incredible group of people in my in my, our, our Bloomberg chat, in our book. The contributors are incredible. Uh, Mark Cuban was really incredible. Now Ferguson, David Einhorn, David Tepper. I'm just talking to different investors. And the feeling that I get is that if you're going to construct a portfolio today, you know, two, five, five years ago, you'd be 60-40, 60% uh, stocks. Uh, 60 percent bonds 40 percent stocks or what depending on your age right but it's always 64 60 40 stocks bonds if you're older you're gonna have more bonds right um but today it's really uh it's really 35 35 30 potentially that I means it could be it could be that much so 35 percent bonds 35 percent stocks and 30 30 percent all kinds of commodities and so you want to own right now probably the best value names, probably some of the copper names, um, the aluminum names, the best, the cheapest, most destroyed part of the hard asset area right now is the REMX, which is your rare earth metals that's been destroyed, mm -hmm. right? So your copper miners, your Alcoas are pretty cheap, Al AA, uh, because your whole grid rebuild on artificial intelligence, the U.S. power grid is going to have to be rebuilt. The U.S. is going to have to spend a lot of money doing that. Uh, Maybe it'll go uh, underground at some point, you know, like all those oh, high yeah. all those power lines in the U.S. that are above ground. Yeah, Me being in Germany has been mind-blowing. But, 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 uh, the, but the grid itself is so weak. It needs more copper, more aluminum. And, uh, you know, this is the this, this, this secret of the book is that we've we've done, you know, we've I, I have this like we've got artificial intelligence, we've got electric vehicles, we've got uh, Bitcoin and we've got India. Think about those four groups. Artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, Bitcoin in India. Those are four colossal uh, electricity consumers. We're talking about the face of, of electricity consumption is going to double over the next five years, potentially. And so you have to have a grid and an infrastructure that supports that. And right now, everybody's investing in kind of chips and in uh, Bitcoin and all this. But. The, the higher Bitcoin goes, eventually it, it requires more processing power. There's a billion people in India that don't have air conditioning. You know, a billion people. And we're raising the standard of in, living in India dramatically uh, by, by decimating the Rust Belt. So all of this points toward a whole host of like you need to own commodity. And then we're going to have the Ukraine rebuild in the next five years, right? Ukraine has to be rebuilt. All that copper, all that steel. And so you want to be... 35% stocks, 35% bonds, and 30% commodities for the next you know, five to 10 years. If you were to break down commodities, very last question, how, how would you weigh it? How much of that should be gold? Out of that 30%, how much should be gold? Well, right now, I mean, gold, I would say a year, you know, year two years ago should be the mothership. I would say you know, see, in the commodity basket, maybe it was, maybe it was, 30, you know, 30% a year or two ago, and it might be now um, 20 to maybe even 15. But you want to diversify. I mean, the oil, the oil names right now, oil cheap. The oil names are cheap relative to the next five years. Um, and, and so what happens is as you move toward recession, a lot of times gold, like that copper gold ratio is pretty crazy right now. Like that. So if you look at copper gold, it, it points toward, once again, a very, very, expensive gold price if you look if you look at gold versus oil same thing once again it looks so you want to be if you look at uranium if you look at platinum everything you do versus gold today is skewed and so you want to have that you know i would say maybe if it's out of that out of that percentage that's in gold um you know two years ago it might have been 30 35 maybe it's 20 to 15 now and then you want to diversify across your aluminum your tin your as many other hard asset commodities as you can find. And eventually, eventually the last group that'll come up will be the uh, ags will come back again. 
we're starting to see a little movement today in, uh, in I think, Mosaic in the last mm-hmm. you know, couple. And then, and then the, the lithium names. The lithium names are destroyed. That's another area that where you'd want to put a little bit more than you would because that's, I'd say right now the cheapest area of your hard assets are your lithium names, your rare earths. Fantastic. Larry, like next time we got to schedule two hours, seriously, <laughs> like there's so much to follow up on. Like how, how much do you, geopoli- uh, like how do you geopol- geopolitical is the lithium price right now is a question we can probably spend another 30 minutes on, um, ex- exploring because that's an interesting topic by itself. Larry, well, let like- me just let me give two. Sh- so here's the first book, the colossal failure of common sense, the inside story of the colossal clutch Lehman brothers. It's one of the best by the ranked by the CFA Institute in the top 20 all time. And then here's a new book, you know, how to listen when markets speak. And we're doing speeches around the country. Uh, we just got back from like, from Toronto, Boston, and uh, Calgary, and, and and Montreal. And now we're we're heading off to uh, we're heading off to um, Zurich and Geneva, Chicago and Miami. So. Hope, hope to see you soon out there. I was going to say, like, I'm based in Frankfurt. I'm 10 minutes away from the airport. So make sure when you pass through uh, to, to hit me up, that would be phenomenal. Yeah, I'm going to do Oktoberfest this year. <laughs> oh, phenomenal. That'll, that'll be a blast. You'll enjoy that. That's going to be fantastic. Larry, I, I'm so appreciative of your time. Like, where can we follow the rest of your work? You got your Twitter handle there, Convert Bond. Um, yeah. But uh, where else can we find more of you? Yeah, Convert Bond is fine. Uh, and then, you know, I just, I think, you know, just at, Bear tra- the bear traps report.com is, is a good spot where you can find us. And we have, what we do is we recap the institutional chat for uh, investors. So we kind of give investors a lens on that buy side conversation at the bear traps report. Phenomenal. Larry, so appreciative of your time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure speaking with you again. It's like, I've, I've got so many more notes. We got to schedule two hours next time. Thank you guys. <laughs> Absolutely best. appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I tremendously enjoyed the conversation here with Larry. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. Like leave a comment below. Have you read the book? Uh, I'm definitely going to order both books right now. The second I get off here and I'm going to read them. And you know what? We're going to, we're going to do a raffle. Please comment book. In, in the comments down below and we'll give away each book to, to you. We'll reach out and we'll send them to you. We're going to keep that open for a week. Let's do that. I haven't thought about that earlier, but let's do that. Comment book down below and we'll uh, you'll automatically enter the raffle and we'll send it out to you if you win. So what, what are your thoughts? Where are we headed? What is going on? What's your favorite commodity? We've had so much great content in the last 45 minutes, 50 minutes here almost. And uh, I want to hear from you. Did we have a did, did we ask the right question? Was this informative for you? Let us know. We always look for some feedback. And of course, if you enjoyed this conversation, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and we do want to hear from you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Sportfinish.